Um, so our next speaker is Dr. Ellen Stofan. She's the John and Adrian Mars Director of the Smithsonian's National Air and Space Museum. She joined the museum in 2018 with more than 25 years of experience in space administration and planetary science. She was previously chief scientist at NASA, and she's also held senior scientist positions at NASA's Jet Propulsion Lab, including work on missions exploring Venus, Earth, Mars, and Saturn. Casual. <laughs> Welcome, Ellen. Thank you. I can't believe I had to cut him off. I'm really <laughs> sorry. And. You know, if you th think you did the four seasons in one a month, I think you said of The Expanse, Jenna. So my husband and I have done all of season one in the last week. <laughs> so when I saw you up here, I was like, oh my God, it's Alex. He's still alive. <laughs> He's still alive. Uh, well, I'm, again, I'm only eight episodes into season one, so I'm so far behind. Sorry, I'm catching up. Um, so anyway, I am Ellen Stofan, the director of the John and Adrian Mars director of the Smithsonian's National Air and Space Museum. And I think it's appropriate this conversation we're having right now because it's this whole issue of what is the Smithsonian's National Air and Space Museum? We are not just a history museum, so we don't just have the right flyer and the spirit of St. Louis and the space shuttle discovery. We're also a culture museum. So before the museum was undergoing renovation as it is right now, you used to be able to walk in and see the Starship Enterprise, the actual model that was used in the filming of the show. And I hope that some of you in your hand-washing practice are using that intro to Star Trek instead of Happy Birthday, if you're tired of that. If you do, these are the voyages of the... Never mind. Okay. Um, anyway, as I said, it's really nice to be here today to talk about what we do at the Air and Space Museum because, as I said, not just a history museum, not just a culture museum, I like to think of us as also being a museum of the future. And so when we think of that, we really have to think about whose stories that we tell at the museum because our fundamental mission at the museum is to... to um, energize and inspire the next generation of explorers and innovators. And if we only tell one kind of story, for example, if we only told the history story and maybe didn't talk about the Starship Enterprise, if we only told the story of Neil Armstrong and didn't tell the story of Mae Jemison, how can we be sure that we're inspiring every kid who might come into the museum, who might someday be sitting where you all are, getting ready to really create that future for aerospace. So I wanted to go through some of the women who have had a seat at the telescope or a seat at the table as we've thought about our history um, in astronomy and astrophysics and space science as well as in exploration. Now probably most of you have not heard of all of the women on this or maybe any of them. In the upper left you see a woman named Phoebe Waterman Haas. She was one of the first women in the United States to get a PhD in astronomy. She got it in 1913. Uh, she was actually fascinated by the sun. She saw a solar eclipse and said, I want to study that. But you know, when she went to school, people would let her look through the telescope, but they were very reluctant to let her participate in actual research until she got to graduate school. And then she found support at Berkeley and went on to get a PhD. And our observatory at the museum is actually named after her, the Phoebe Waterman Haas Observatory. In the lower left, you see uh, a woman named Henrietta Swan Leavitt. She was a computer, so she was one of these women, early, in her case, early in the, the 20th century. She worked at the Harvard uh, Astro Astronomical Observatory, which is actually now part of the Smithsonian. And she was allowed to do calculations about stars, but they wouldn't let her do actual research. They said, you're just a computer. You're not a scientist. You don't get to do research. But she actually, by looking at some stars called the Cepheids, she actually figured out how to measure astronomical distance. So to tell how far are other stars from our star, how far are other galaxies from our galaxy. There's actually a play about her right now is recently at the Ford's Theater here in Washington 
called Silent Sky that goes through her story, which is incredibly inspiring. She was recognized for her work, um, but she actually died fairly young, and several years after she died, someone actually tried to nominate her for the Nobel Prize, very few of which have gone to women, um, but they don't give them posthumously, so she wasn't eligible. Now, unlike some of the women on this, on this slide, the woman in the upper right you probably recognize, that's Katherine Johnson. Um, she's the African-American mathematician who did the fundamental calculations uh, that helped the Mercury astronauts make it up into space. It was her calculations that when John Glenn was about to launch on his first flight to become the first American to orbit the Earth, he said, has that girl from Virginia checked the numbers? Uh, because he was mistrusting the early computers, actual computers, not people, uh, that were doing the trajectory calculations. And so it was Catherine's work that really enabled humans to get to space. But at the time, and in the very middle of, you know, Langley Space Flight Center where she worked was in uh, southeastern Virginia. Jim Crow laws were in full effect in the 1960s. And so she was going out and not being allowed to enter into restaurants, not being allowed to go places, and yet here she was going to NASA and doing all this incredibly fundamental work. And she actually had to basically push her way into meetings where she wasn't welcomed because she knew that if they didn't have her work, they wouldn't be able to get the job done. So it's that perseverance that I think is really amazing. The woman in the lower right is a woman named Nancy Gra uh, Grace Roman. She was the first director of astronomy uh, at NASA here in Washington, and she's often called the mother of the Hubble Space Telescope because she really helped conceive the program and helped push Hubble through, and there was a lot of opposition to it over the years, um, and so she's fondly remembered uh, for that. All of these women have something in common. One of them is, is that, with the exception of Katherine Johnson, and we've only known her story really popularly for about the last three or four years, most of these women you've never heard of because their stories haven't been being told. And yet the work they did is just as fundamental as many of the other scientists whose stories you've heard. So our work at the National Air and Space Museum is really to make sure that we tell all the stories, not just some of them, to make sure that there's room for inspiration for everyone. Now, my story, I feel like, is not a very normal one. So my dad worked for NASA. Um, my mom was a science teacher. My sister was an attorney, so this actually didn't affect her. But I went to my first launch when I was four. But when I was growing up, I actually never really thought about working at NASA where my dad worked because no one that look, looked like me worked there. They all looked like my dad. And so when I thought about being a scientist, I used to go to the library and look for books about women scientists. And I would find books about Marie Curie, and pretty much Marie Curie, and on a good day, maybe another book about Marie Curie. <laughs> and that's also probably why I'm so passionate about making sure that we do tell all the stories, not just some of them. After my freshman year in college, that's that unfortunate picture of me on the uh, upper right, um, I actually had an internship at the National Air and Space Museum in Washington, D.C. I'm working in their Center for Earth and Planetary Studies, um, where we still have a great group of scientists helping to explore Mars and the Moon and the other planets of the solar system. And, you know, I found great mentors there, but I didn't see anybody who looked like me. And so, as I've gone through my career, that issue of mentorship, that issue of being there, has been really important to me. Because when I got to points in my career, where, which were many, where I was the only woman in the room, where an idea that I would speak out about five minutes later would be repeated by a man and everybody in the room would go, that's a great idea, um, or in the meetings I'd have where it was all men in the room, and one guy would swear, he had a terrible mouth, he would swear, and he'd look around the room and he'd go, sorry, Ellen. And then he'd go on speaking again and he would swear again and he'd look at me and go, sorry, Ellen. What was he doing? He was making me feel like I didn't belong. I didn't like him swearing, it was true. <laughs> but on the other hand, he was pointing out that I was different from everyone else. 
But you know, the truth is, I didn't feel any different from anybody else in this room. Because no matter what you look like, if you're there to get a job done, that's what you're thinking about. You're thinking about how you're going to get the job done. You're not thinking about what you look like. But I had a huge amount of support from my parents, from teachers, from colleagues. I went on, I studied the geology of Venus, the geology of Mars, uh, and I got to work when I was at NASA headquarters on architectures to send humans to Mars. So lots of fun things. And I also go out in the field and study volcanoes, uh, which is a lot of fun. And I've talked about women in the past whose stories we want to tell. But there are women doing amazing things right now that I think you should know about. Women like Katie Bowman, she's there in the, sorry, I don't know my right from my left, uh, in the upper left. Um, so Katie is a student you might have seen recently. She was part of a team called the Event Horizon Telescope Team. Uh, she was a postdoc who helped to write some of the undergraduate, or graduate student then postdoc, who helped write some of the algorithms that helped create the first image ever of a black hole. And she became really popularized because there was a photo, uh, there was some video of her when they got the data back and they realized they had finally been able to process the data and she just had this look of absolute happiness on her face at the fact that we had, for the first time in humanity, actually been able to image uh, a black hole. So she's an amazing, she just is now uh, early faculty at Caltech uh, and she's going to go on to do amazing things. Crystal Johnson, good friend of mine, she's the deputy director of NASA's Goddard Space Flight Center. Uh, Crystal actually started out as an intern at NASA. So for many of you, if you started out as an intern, I started out as an intern at Air and Space, ended up the director. Crystal started out as an intern at Goddard, and now she's the deputy director. She's an amazing engineer uh, and does very cool work at Goddard. Ellen Ochoa. In, she uh, became the first Hispanic American woman to fly in space in 1993 on the space shuttle. She made four trips uh, into space and then finished her career at NASA as the director of NASA's Johnson Space Center in, in Houston, Texas. One of the important things about Ellen to understand is the first time she applied to the astronaut corps, like many people who've applied to the astronaut corps, they didn't let her in. She failed. And so what did she do? Did she say, oh, well? No. She said, wow, maybe if I got a private pilot's, pilot's license, my application would look better. Maybe if I go and work for NASA, my application will look better. So she did that. She applied again, and she became an astronaut uh, and obviously went on to amazing things. The woman on the far side of the slide is a woman named Amber Strawn. She also works at Goddard Space Flight Center. Um, she's one of the deputy project scientists on the James Webb Space Telescope being built by Northrop Grumman uh, that should launch into space next year. James Webb is an amazing telescope that's going to be able to look back to within tens of millions of years of the Big Bang. And Amber uh, did research on Hubble data and then went on to, uh, she studies the origins of galaxies and galaxy variation. Um, and she's, again, an amazing scientist. And when we start getting data back from James Webb, you're going to hear a lot more about her. So as I've said, at the Air and Space Museum, our job is to find all these stories and to tell them to the public. So we are actually in the process of renovating our museum downtown because it was falling down. That's a whole not long story that I won't tell. But in the process, we get to reimagine all 23 galleries and spaces within the museum. So we really get to think about what are the stories about aviation and space exploration that we're telling? What are the people we're talking about who used those airplanes, who invented those telescopes, who did the research? And in that doing so, we can really tell all the stories because, again, what we're trying to do is inspire people like that young girl at the top of the slide. We also run a summer aviation camp uh, for girls from Title I schools around this area. So really thinking about how we reach out and change the face of STEM to look more like the face of our population. And we're going to be telling new stories in the museum, not just stories about the Wright brothers, but also about the people inventing flying cars, not just stories about Apollo, but stories about how we're going to send humans back to the moon and onto Mars. So thank you for all that the work that you all do. 
stay with it. You're going to change the face of aerospace. What you do someday, well, someday we'll be talking about it at the Air and Space Museum. So thank you very much.